supply. We may be a, a minute or so early, but I'll let All you right. know. It's 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. I'm seeing 659. Oh, well, I believe Bill. He's got the military time over there. It just hit 7 just now. All right. Cool. All right. So uh, are we live? Yeah, we're on. We're live. Hey, hello, everybody. <laughs> and uh, welcome to another episode of Police Off the Cuff After Hours. My name is Mark DeMeo. I'm going to be your host, my co-host in all Big things Mark law enforcement. What's up, Bill Cannon? What's happening, man? A lot of stuff happening. A lot of stuff. Well, we couldn't have a better guest. He's returning. Um, he's uh, he's uh, underdressed tonight slightly. I'm not used to I'm seeing you like that. Are you kidding me? There's a size profile not... here. Well, first of all, you know, more. guns out. Oh, the, oh, the guns are out. <laughs> hey, uh, but you're also in a different room. Where's the where's that uh, palm tree? That's that, in that's the door. Sexy. Yeah, no, oh, like, that, that's for the that, TV. That's in, no, that's no, no, no. That's that, right? No, that's another part of my house. And so that's the TV set. I, I'm taking the Mark DeMeo um, backdrop. So you see, so, we got uh, the same color in the walls, right? So. This is this is the intro that I had from to, for you tonight, and I, I forgot to do it. Coming to you live via satellite, <laughs> all the way from the Marcy Projects in Bed Stuy. Wow, Give wow, it up wow, for wow, Dr. Wow, Darren wow, Porcher, wow, folks. <laughs> Two guns up, finger yeah. pistols, and all of that. <laughs> you won't see this on Fox or PIX or CNN. How comfortable you sit that next to that? Window? Let me tell you, I got news for you. I got pants on for a change. <laughs> so normally, he's got his camo. He's got his camo. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, he's you know. in the army too, man. BFW built for war. I knew That's that this you was going to be. Too, man, you got a, you got every box checked. This is a wartime interview, so I came prepared. <laughs> BFW built for war. There you go. So, because I know Mark, I know Mark goes commando, so I just need no, to no, let him know. I hope, yeah. I hope he doesn't stand up. I don't want to. <laughs> no, I always got my shorts on, but you got a yeah, pink, sure, sure. You got, sure, you got a pink okay. shirt on, and you got camouflage shorts. And after this is over, I would imagine where are we going right after for drinks. We're going downtown, maybe to uh, <laughs> Chelsea. <laughs> Stop off at an outdoor bar. <laughs> no, we're going to Stein. We're going to Steinway Street. Okay? Oh, yeah, that's congrats. What we're did you see that party? Yeah, that's a legitimate oh, lunacy. Man. Did you see that you know, party? How could de Blasio keep open that, uh, um, close off that street and make that one of those closed street blocks? It's just totally beyond me. But it, I, one thing I give de Blasio credit for is his incompetence has been consistent. He's a consistent so as a result idiot. of that, that's yeah, true. right, right. So as a result of that, you know, this is kind of how he does business. So I give did him credit. Did you he see I grabbed the same way across the board. Darren, you see I grabbed our uh, banner? Yeah, 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 yeah. He Some gave banner. me excellent. Yeah, yeah. You know what? You know what, Darren? You bring up a good point because, uh, it, yeah, he he doesn't seem to surprise us. I mean, it's always he always seems to surprise us at the next level of. Um, Mark, I got to be careful when you say bring up the point. You're not wearing underwear right now, and I'm oh, a straight man, guy, I'm so good. I just let it. Oh, get out of here! Oh, I got okay. the same shorts on I always wear. That that's a photoshopped image. I know what's yeah, going on. So. Here, these are, these okay. are my house shorts. Are you crazy? Oh, okay. Got a house yeah. shorts. <laughs> he won't go out in those shorts. That's why the house shorts. Mm. <laughs> I play yeah. ball in these shorts, everything. I never wash them. And <laughs> Bill stage, and, and Bill is wearing a fishing net below the waist. <laughs> hey, I took my and spin only, class today. Yeah, right. I took a Zumba. Oh, yeah, 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 so, yeah. Bill took a Zumba class. class outside. What, outside. No, what did you do? Zumba today? No, oh, I took spin, not Zumba. Oh, spin. <laughs> now, now let me ask you, is there like a, a, a virtual image that's on the bike where there's like videos and things to that effect? No, no, where there's like a, team building? There's, okay. a, uh, there's a leader. There's a, a, a spin leader. She's right, but it's, all right. Oh, so the leader is at the front. So you yeah, don't yeah. have like the, the virtual, the, um, I guess. No, not, the, not like okay. Peloton. That's Peloton. Oh, okay. I got you. Oh, I got you. $200 one of those bikes. But you guys, you said you guys were outdoors today, right? Yeah. Did you ride around the neighborhood and, and enjoy no, the whole neighborhood in the sun and stuff like that? It had a, it had a, uh, a like a tent over us. Oh, so you, you just, know, you just rode the bike in place? Yes, yeah. Even even though it was beautiful out, and you could have probably just went for a fucking ride by yourself. <laughs> well, Bill, I also noted because you you were one of those guys that had like one of those iPads attached to the bike. 
and you were looking at Lizzo porn and it allowed yeah, yeah, you right. yourself to, to manifest. <laughs> you know? I get kicked out of this gym. You, 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 you had a lot of, I know you got a lot of love for Lizzo. That was some of my students on. in college were viewing uh, porn while I was lecturing. You know, <laughs> you know, long before this Peloton thing came out, I thought of a, a software for you to put on a, on a stationary bike, or not a stationary, a, a, a treadmill, where you'd be running and the closer you got to whatever image that you want, you like, you enjoyed. A cheeseburger. Uh, they, no, well, they would lose another article of clothes. <laughs> so the closer, you know what I'm saying? So you keep chasing them. And then at some point they would be naked and there'd be another one. And then that, that was my thing. Mm, but um, okay, cool. I never, that was just another idea that I never threw out there and I never made a penny on it. But I think it, I think it's, it still could sell. Hey, Mark, you don't have one hair out of place. You know, you have gel in your hair. How do you keep your hair like that? Because I'm a, I'm a black guy. So you a, you know? Well, you got a nice haircut. You know, you you, uh, you were kind of sort of rocking the flat top almost, but, right? But now you no, went... a black, a black flat top? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. No, like with the suit? <laughs> Is no, that... I, never, I can't say that I ever had one. <laughs> Did you have cornrows when you were a teenager? No, but I had a blonde tail. Oh, uh, OK. That's right. I'm sorry. Bill, Bill was the guy that had the cornrows. I'm 53. <laughs> I'm 53. So me too. So do you remember the, the when people used to rock the tails? My hair never got beyond I, much. But you remember it, right? When I got, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, I had the best. Mine was like this long and I, I, I bleached it blonde. Oh, the white guys. You could have been in the movie Saturday Night Fever back then, you know? Back then it was, uh, <laughs> you were either into disco or rock and roll or mm. rock. And when they seen that blonde tail move, Ooh, they used to hate me, man. Mm. The rock, the okay. rock guys. So we're gonna talk mm. about the police work or what? Oh yeah, I forgot. That's why we're here. Yeah. So exactly. before we started to go live, Bill brought up the um, what happened to the Comstat meeting, and uh, for those who don't know, that's the the annual the the weekly is it weekly right? Uh, monthly usually. Monthly meeting that you go down to one police plaza, and basically. Um, you know, you'd have to answer for the spike in crime in your command if you were the, the, the CEO of your command. And um, then we actually had uh, an inspector. He left the job, Brea, because he was pissed off that they were still doing going to Comstat in the middle of uh, this, you know, we got our hands tied. So now people are going to Comstat, these bosses, and they're, they're telling the chiefs, they're like, yo, we, you know, we can't do nothing right now. And what happened, Bill? Well, our chief from uh, Manhattan North Narcotics raised the issue that his guys are afraid to get involved physically with a perp because of the uh, diaphragm law and that they're afraid that, um, you know, they could be arrested for doing their job. So Chief Monaghan responded, I wasn't afraid on the Brooklyn Bridge. Congratulations. You know, you weren't afraid right. of the Brooklyn Bridge. No cop is afraid. But... Cops are afraid to get arrested for doing their job. And then he says, we spoke to all the DAs and they all said they won't prosecute for that, like for putting your knee on a perp's back. But a cop has already been arrested. On June 26th, a cop in Queens, his name was actually David Athanador, was arrested for using the banned chokehold on a career criminal. That, and they arrested the cop two days later. So I don't know how Monaghan goes and says, oh, we spoke to the DAs. And you know, as well as I do, if an arrest becomes political, they'll lock anybody up for it. They'll fold like a chair. Yeah, exactly. So it was so disingenuous. And the whole point also is another chief tried to jump in and he, he silenced her. Every cop in the field was worried about this. And rightfully so. What has to happen is they have to reverse that law that came from the city council and Cuomo signed the choke law statewide. That has to be reversed or cops aren't going to do shit. And people in this city are going to see crime coming back at a speed they never thought was ever possible. Because as you can see now, people are getting shot every single night now. There's, there's multiple homicides every week now. And it's because, well, there's multiple reasons, Darren. I don't have to tell you, but you can tell our audience why you believe that's so. Well, there's been a meteoric rise in crime in the wake of the death of George Floyd. There's been an echoing sentiment of police reform that's been plaguing the United States from the east to the west coast. 
but there hasn't really been anything that was solution based. You hear defunding, you hear a lot of these lunatics say, let's ban the police and let's let the community take the um take that position of public safety. We right. saw how successful that played out in Seattle in connection with the CHOP zone. We had homicides, multiple shootings. That was not the case. The social contract needs to take effect and establish a, a posture in ensuring that we as law-abiding citizens are protected by government. And people just don't understand that. When you have an element of lawlessness that exists, you can say to yourself, hey, look, you know what? I may be fully capable to take care of myself, but remember your elderly relatives, remember the infants in your family, those individuals don't have the same um, fortifications that you do because, you know, I'm speaking as a retired um, member, a retired lieutenant from the NYPD. Do I carry my gun everywhere? I carry my gun for me with me when I go to the supermarket. So I carry it everywhere. <laughs> but there's just a lot of people that just may see it from a different, through a different lens. And it goes back to these, the, the level of crime that is plaguing our society is something that's being perpetuated by the failure of elected officials to, uh, to act more so specific to democratic leaders throughout the country. We are under siege. When we take in consideration gun violence that is holding these communities hostage, such as Chicago and New York, the gross majority of these victims are people of color. So you hear the echoing sentiment of Black Lives Matter. Hell yeah, Black Lives Matter. But if Black Lives Matter to you, how come I haven't seen you not one day into one of these communities in pursuit of the criminals that are victimized in these communities, nor put forth a message that lets the people in that community know that we are banding together against violence. That's not happening. Last right. week, when I hear, you know, it's funny, I hear Monaghan speak to how he was injured on the bridge, and that was his war story that enables him to have a level of, 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 of a Teflon skin. How he's right, right. Yeah. 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 I was on that bridge too. I, I yeah. was on that bridge too. And one of the things I didn't see when Monaghan was injured, I believe that it happened, of course, because there was video that supported his his, uh, his position in this. But it goes back to I, we were marching with the clergy. There were police sympathizers and clergy. And the march was in, in opposition to gun violence and violence that's plaguing in our communities in the wake of this crime surge. And we were demanding an answer from Mayor de Blasio to take action and take action now. At the same time we were walking over that bridge was the same time de Blasio was seated and signing off on that chokehold bill. And, right. and if you notice, there was a sign that stated Black Lives Matter at that very same table. We need you to, to, to put the goddamn paintbrushes down in front of Trump Tower and pick up the law enforcement tools and effectively direct the practitioners in policing to eradicate gun violence. We are spending more money to preserve and protect that mural in front of um, Trump Tower that states Black Lives Matter yeah. than we are to catch the perpetrators that killed the one-year-old out in Brooklyn. Oh, yeah. We clearly don't have our priorities in order, and this is a sentiment of the failed policies that are emanating from City Hall. It's outrageous. Just to get back to the ComStat meeting for one second, if the chiefs brought this up at a ComStat meeting, which I don't know if you ever presented at ComStat, but it's basically a bull bully pulpit for the dais. I've you know, been to ComStat numerous times. Yeah, they beat, uh, they beat you down. So you, you could tell how timidly this chief said this once he was confronted by Monaghan, he became timid. Initially, he wasn't timid. He just said, my guys are afraid to take action. And then Monaghan came across like, you know, oh, yeah. He, he doesn't get the he only, says, what, the only never, way they'll change should never be afraid. Yeah. The only way they'll, change, the way they'll change this law is if cops aren't active, if they're not making arrests, if they're not engaging the community. Then they'll have to change it back because crime will be out of control like it was in the 90s. But if you still do what you're supposed to do with the threat of arrest hanging over your head, first of all, you're a fool. And second of all, I don't know how he could say, oh, the DAs, we spoke to them. They're not going to. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding Sound me? Soundbite to have when you get indicted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You need to read the tea leaves and the tea leaves specifically state that this is something that's up and coming. You can guarantee that you're going to get arrested if you embark upon this level of conduct. 
And Bill, you mentioned that a few minutes ago when you spoke to the arrest on um, out in Far Rockaway when the officer put his arm around the the the, um, the perpetrator's neck in attempt to take him into custody or restrain him. It was only momentarily, I because I saw that video and I analyzed it frame by frame. This wasn't an overly egregious chokehold with the intent of court creating asphyxiation. It right. was it was restraining the individual. As soon as he was restrained, the officers immediately cuffed him, stepped up, and took him off scene. This was a crazy guy, man. But it just goes back to well, what Mark, you're saying. Mark, I'm sorry, got you. Mark is bigger than both of us. Mark's like six four, about two forty, right? Am I or I, am I underweighing you? No, but, thanks, for, thanks for the 240. All right, 240, we'll say. Okay. He's a big guy. A a add a couple of donuts on there. Now, take him to 260, you right? Get, you get a guy who's 135 pounds, and he doesn't want to be cuffed, and you can't put your knee in his back. He ain't getting cuffed. And guess what? Mark's going to get hurt. Well, it's it's even bigger than that. It's not just putting your knee to someone's back. If you restrain the person by pinning their back or their shoulders to the floor, you right. are still in a you, you are still in effect immobilizing that person's diaphragm. Therefore, you would your acts your actions would constitute an arrestable act in the wake of this chokehold legislation that's been introduced. It's and preposterously absurd. No matter no matter what the crime is. If, if what happened, what you just described happened, they're going to forget about that crime and they're going to look to indict the, uh, the officer. 100%. 100%. You're right. So now, this guy, Monaghan, who went out one day, by, by the way, I don't know how many days he's been out, but let's just say it was that one day and he got hit in the head 10 minutes later. So imagine you got to go back to work tomorrow and then the next day and then the next day. How many times are you going to get hit in the head before... You know what I'm saying? I don't know how these guys are doing it. I, yeah, neither do I. I mean, this is a, it's a troubling narrative to say the least. And it's the law, but it's eight and a half million law abiding citizens in the city of New York that are suffering as a result of the ineffectiveness of our elected leaders that are drawing legislation that is in favor of the mob. These people that are screaming and hollering, but they're not a true re representation or reflection of the policy uh, of, of the people that live in this city that are law abiding citizens. It's a damn well, shame. What brings me up to uh, brings us up to this point is, um, you know, I always think about like the, how it's cyclical in a way, depending on the administration. But, you know, we have a certain amount of homicides that happen. And then, uh, you know, like for right now, let's say we had 20 homicides in this city, right? And I think maybe 16 of them were male Blacks um, or, or African Americans, and the other four were Hispanic. And it just seems like, you know, and, and then you think about Chicago with Lightfoot over there, the mayor, how many homicides they have every weekend. Lightfoot also people, or wrong foot. Uh, wrong also, foot, yeah. <laughs> also uh, people of color. And it seems like, um, I hate to say it, but until this white person gets killed and then it's like, Oh, okay. That's enough. That's enough. Now we got, we got to stop. We got to let the police do their jobs. Do you know what I'm saying? It seems like these, for some reason, nobody, like they don't pay attention to these homicides. They don't you pay know, attention it, to the numbers because if you did and you said, I don't want any, and another person of color dying in this city, you know, I'm going to let the police do what they have to do. Because at some point, they're going to let the police do what they have to do. But at that point, it's going to be so many lives uh, that are lost already. And most of them are going to be people of color. You know, you're absolutely right. Bill and Mark, you can relate to this story. You guys remember years ago, I think it was like the 80s. Um, Watkins. We had, I'm sorry? Uh, the, the family. Yes, 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 exactly. Watkins, you remember yeah. when he got the, the knife plunged into his chest in the subway? Protecting yeah. his mother. All hell went broke loose. That's in exactly with, my point. Yeah, That's yeah. Exactly about, point. I, I like, like, like this ship overnight the fan at a hundred miles an hour, and we need to do something, and we need to do it now. And that's what it took. And it's just, it's just so unfortunate, you know, I, because one thing that I do credit the NYPD with is you have an amazing collection of talent that falls within that 38,000 sworn officers in the NYPD. 
you need to allow the practitioners to take flight and embark upon a campaign of law enforcement that is sound for the population. Policy is coming from City Hall. It's not coming from one police plaza. I'm not telling you that you need to just take the reins off the cops and let them do whatever the hell you, that they want to do. No, it can be a tempered response, but it can be sound. And the, both of you were on the job when we had Operation Juggernaut back in the early 90s. Um, it it, it kind of ran like um, consistent with the, uh, the zero, um, zero tolerance policing under Bratton. We had amazing gains as a result of taking action against these quality of life offenses. Now is not the time to negotiate. Now is the time for aggressive, aggressive forward police, at, police action. When I say aggressive, that doesn't mean that we're looking to violate people's um, constitutionally protected rights. No, but what I'm saying is now is the time that we really need to take the cuffs off of the, uh, we need to take the cuffs off of the cops and put the cuffs on the criminals. You know that Bozo de Blasio had the balls to say in a press conference that our levels of incarceration are lower than that of World War II. And therefore this makes us, that this, this brings us to the safest point in our society. I couldn't believe you that's said not, that. I just yeah, yo, I, I, when that. I heard that, I just said, Somebody should just run him over with a this guy is just right a jacket on the podium. Well, prisons are empty. That makes okay. us safer. He said okay. that. He actually said that. I was like, I couldn't believe he said that. Yeah, I, I was thinking about. And there was no one that nudged him on the side. No, he's a fool. Wait, 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 he's just wait, wait, a fool. You know. Yeah. I was thinking about that statement. I was thinking to myself, what, what is he talking about? The safer part. Where, 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 like, because I'm sure in his brain somewhere. He has a, there's something safer because uh, maybe the corrections officers are safer. <laughs> because they're less oh, yeah, like, uh, Releasing career criminals from state right. prisons, empty in Rikers, that makes us safer. The yeah. only people that are safer are the correction officers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's just so unfortunate. Um, you need a person like Bill, that's a practitioner working in homicide for years on end that has a, a, a strong understanding of the mindset of a lot of these guys that are on the street that should be incarcerated. So you need to sit down when I say you, I mean, they're gonna reject your ideas, Bill, so don't even think yeah, that this no, is gonna happen. That. But, I but I, yeah, yeah, at the same token, but we just really need to have a practitioner-based panel that, that, has, that, that employs an information exchange with our elected officials that are willing to fall behind or, or, or uh, uh, believe that what you're saying is a sensible and plausible solution. We have Jamani Williams, who's the New York City public advocate that's a lunatic. The inmates are running the building yeah, when exactly. you have him at the helm. Exactly. And then you have Corey Johnson, is the, who's the speaker of the city council, which is the biggest lunatic on the face of this earth. He needs yeah. to go back to Boston. He doesn't understand the concept of life in a, a, a diverse city such as New York. Well, then, let me just stop you, just stop you okay. for a second. Liberals always say, we believe in science. Then why didn't they consult anyone that are the scientists that uh, understand police work? Maki Haberfeld, you know, from John Jay College. All, all these genius police, Bratton. Why didn't they ask these people, will this me. work? Me! Why didn't they ask the that. experts? They were never asked. Instead, Cuomo gets Letitia James to do, a, to do a hit job on the NYPD. She does a 57 page report that was just an out and out hit job on the NYPD. Nothing, there are no teeth to this, you know, like this panel, even de Blasio rejected it and said that this is nonsense. What it was was a waste of money. I think Letitia James is someone that focuses on what the loudest voice in the room is, and she yeah. will, will will bend to that sentiment. She's not coming from an empirical perspective of crime. Uh, she That's not her background. No. She may have a law degree, but in no way, shape, or form is she that effective law enforcement official um, that's suited to be an attorney general. That's not who she is. No. Not saying that you need to be a cop to be the attorney general, but I think you need to have an understanding of the criminal justice process and how you can effectively gain precipitous drops in crime. That's not what she has. And that's what we have in Letitia James. Well, these people just have a deep seated hatred for cops too. 
And hey, you know, I, Bill, I don't think it's so much as just a deep seated hatred. I mean, you have a small contingent of people that feel that way, but I think the overall masses are doing a pylon, so to speak. So when we look at the advent of Black Lives Matter in Antifa, what they do is they run around like lunatics, they raise the banner and they say that the, the place is out of control, it's hyper-aggressive racism that is plaguing society, but it's not solution-based. And so you have politicians like Letitia James, Mayor de Blasio, Giovanni Williams, and Corey Johnson, they see 6,000 people that are amassed in front of City Hall, and they think that that's the growing sentiment of the population. Right. 6,000 people don't mean shit in comparison to eight and a half million people that live in this city. When you go into these communities, you will find out that many of these communities want police. Is there room for reform? Absolutely. But the reform that I propose is from a professional development perspective. I think we need to inject more money into departments so we can, we can fortify them with resources that can better enable them to deal with the criminal climate that's plaguing our society. And it's just not happening. That's no. reform. It's not defunding a police department by one $1 billion when that same police department is experiencing precipitous drops in personnel as it relates to attrition and not having the backfill that was scheduled to attend the police academy. The, the, the ranks are stretched thin and the cops can only do so much coupled with uh, these assemblances of protests that are happening throughout the city. Now we have to, it, we have to detail a, a series of cops to manage these disputes, but what, who's managing the radio in these precincts that are under siege? We're very limited with the boots on the ground. And not just that, Darren, who would want to take this job now? How are they going to recruit people um, to take this Eric job? Eric Adams, um, he wants to do like some sort of study or to do an investigation into uh, radio call response time because he feels like the uh, uh, sector cars are dragging their feet going to calls. He dragged well, his it, feet for 20 years and he wasn't even doing a slowdown. That's just the way he worked. If you look at the quantitative statistics in terms of they, this is a very advanced study that, that I, and I'm okay with, I think that's a good thing if we do conduct the study in connection with response times, because that's when you see the immense depletion of personnel uh, within the department that are constantly working below minimum manning and doing what they can just to manage the ship. And then I think you revisit this and say that, you know what, there's an extreme void in the police department that needs to be filled. So when you go back to this, uh, these reorganizations of police reform, that's when you'll understand that, hey, look, we need to inject what's necessary. And you know, both of you guys can attest to this because you were cops for 20 plus years, the both of you. We've always been behind the eight ball as cops and we've worked with what we've had for the longest. And the same thing was told to us year on end. Yeah, we know it sucks. We have a proposal in to get A, B and C and it never came to fruition. So we just did what we had. We, we did what we had to do with what we had. What was that model we've done so much for so long with so little that now we can do almost anything with nothing? Yeah. yeah <laughs> no, I just got to get some place up in one second. Go ahead, guys. But, you know, Dan, I just wanted to bring up another thing. There is a blueprint for keeping crime low in New York City. And that blueprint, we, we could call it, was drawn up by the forefathers of Comstat, Jack Maple, uh, John Timoney, Louis Anamone, and I'm sure I'm leaving some people out. But, but that, those, those are the three key figures. Right. So that blueprint was drawn up 30-something years ago. Primarily and Jack Mason. Since then, crime has dropped because they followed the tenets of Comstat. And Absolutely. they tweaked it here and there when necessary. And it was funny. The guy today in the Comstat meeting was talking about going back to buy and bust again. And yeah, to I heard me, that. I yeah, heard to that. Me, I that was the guy from... Yeah, yeah, no, they did stop. They stopped using undercovers for a period of time um, because there were there were a couple of controversial shootings and the undercovers were in somewhat of an uproar and they were just uncomfortable going out. And so what they revolutionized it and made it a snoo operation. For those of, those of you that don't know what a snoo operation is, that's basically officers in uniform um, conducting uh, observations resulting in the uh, the arrest of buyers and sellers. And, you know, they're just getting by on this stuff, but I just think it's more checking off the boxes right. and not, not, not looking at it 
from a qualitative perspective as a how does this machine run effectively? And so Bill, to your credit, the foundation was built 30 plus years ago by those three phenomenal individuals. But all of the gains that we've achieved in policing have, have been single-handedly dismantled by the de Blasio administration in a matter of three months. Unbelievable. You know what though, honestly, when I, when I hear that they, they're talking about buy and bust, I'm thinking to myself right now, uh, I don't know, is that what the most important thing is right now? You know what well, I'm saying? Well, and when you look at why the department continues to like just go back to business, like if I see a car on the um, a highway guy, you know, in his spot, you know, looking with the radar gun, looking to get a speeder, I keep thinking to myself, is that what we're doing right now? When we got protests all over the fucking city, damaging, you know, because they're going after federal buildings and every night it's a thing. Um, why are we still going back to pretending like we're going to just for the numbers sake? Well, you bring, you bring up a good point and you have to look at when we go back to the early 90, 90s, one of the things that I spoke to briefly was Operation Juggernaut. That's when you put immense levels of personnel into narcotics. And what they did was a lot of buy and bust. The buy and bust wasn't, I mean, getting drugs off the street was one thing, but the terminal piece to that was eliciting intelligence for what was happening in those particular neighborhoods. You lock somebody up for selling drugs and they give, there's an information exchange where it's, look, you know what? I'm not willing to do time for this, but I will bargain with you in, in a proffer agreement is what we refer to it in the courts. And in, in exchange for giving you great information, my sentence will be reduced. Believe it or not, it worked well because it gave the police department an immense amount or immense level of intelligence as to what was happening in those communities. You even had a narcotics homicide unit Whereas what they did was they focused on areas where there was a homicide and they sent out buy and bus teams. They made buys and they flipped the people that they arrested who gave them information that was terminal to arresting people in connection with the commission of these homicides. I understand what you're saying that you may feel that, look, drugs are not the preface to what's plaguing society in the wake That's of these demonstrations. Just, you know, when you're at a fucking detail for the hundredth fucking day in a row, you know, it's another protest. It's a fucking another, uh, and you want that. And then there's some guy in highway. He's sitting there looking to write a, a fucking speeder. It's like, no, let's fucking put an end to this fucking thing. Get everybody right. on board. Knock the shit out of this fucking thing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when we're thinking about like, okay, there's only thirty five thousand cops in this city. You know what I'm saying? So right. well, why spread it even thinner? Address the fucking problem. Make it a real inconvenience for anybody to come out and want to destroy anything, stop letting these guys get it overmanned and fucking bottle shit. You know what I always thought about too? It always seems like there's a front of police and then there's, uh, you know, the protesters, but behind them is all the shit coming. The, why, don't, why don't we have a line of fucking coming right behind them? Well, and one of the things keeping them off every time they throw something, fucking grab them, lock them up. They should be coming from behind because they were told to like to take a light touch. Listen, yeah, you know, yeah, what yeah. Is the light and that came touch? and what Bill was saying is accurate. That came from City Hall. Yeah. That yeah. didn't come from the hierarchy in the department. And here's the thing too, because you need police commissioners that are willing to fucking lose the job. Yeah, that, I agree. You know what I'm saying, I'm and totally, they should all come totally. together. Anybody who's up for that job should all come together and have a meeting and say, you know what? We're going to fucking take care of this city no matter what. We're going to do what we do, no matter what. And if you get fired, you get fired. And that everybody knows that, that they're going to go out. Everybody's thinking about this next fucking position that they might have somewhere, the next fucking job. I think well, take care of the one you have right now. Take care of the people that you fucking came up with because, you know, demanding fucking... Buying bus and this. No, let's fucking put an end to all this fucking. Have you been down to City Hall over there? Uh, the, the... Yeah, no. I know Bill Bill had something that he wanted to say, and I don't no, want to no, step I, I think that if uh, Commissioner Shea, PC Shea, and Chief of Department Monaghan both retired, you know, more or less resigned, people don't realize they don't lose their job. Shea has over 30 years, Monaghan has over 37 years. If they both retired, that would send a huge message would probably help the next people. Yeah, but they don't need to retire. What they need to do is stand up first and get fucking fired. 
gets fired. Yeah, these exactly. buffers to work, right. and then the next right. fucking police commissioner that gets picked also knows what the deal is. We're not going to fucking fold. We're not going to fucking bend over backwards. We're going to lock people up if they destroy property. And then, you know, then that's... Except not, the, mayor, the mayor is like the president. He's the commanding officer of the police department. Yeah, that's yeah. the point. And if he doesn't have anybody to go to... See, he has that thing that you're going to be fired. You're going to be fired if you don't listen to what I say. So if every single fucking chief that he goes to after that is going to fucking... Mark, I, I think that those are valid points, but this is what, what do you, what, Mark, Bill, what's your take on this? I think that if Shea was to come to the forefront the day that chokehold legislation was introduced and ratified by um, Mayor de Blasio, if Shea was to come to the podium and say, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, the direction that the mayor is taking the police department in does not run consistent with public safety. So myself, as the police commissioner of the NYPD, I am now electing to resign my, my office based on the safety for citizens in the city of New York. If he was to step out like that, that would have forced the Blasio's hand but for whoever would have come in. By Cuomo. That was signed statewide by Cuomo. Yeah, but, 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 but Cuomo that cannot that position. Cuomo, Cuomo, Cuomo cannot set the pre, cannot set policy for the NYPD, nor can he appoint nor remove the police commissioner. The police commissioner is appointed and can be removed by the mayor. And if if Shea would have taken that position, he could have gotten any job he wanted anywhere in the world yeah. because people would have looked to him as a, a, a person that has a real sound foundation for public safety and he is not going to alter his pathway in the wake of an elected official that doesn't understand the concept of law enforcement. That would have happened. The next person that would have been appointed police commissioner could have run all over de Blasio and said the same thing at the podium. Look, you know what? I'm trying to keep the citizens in New York safe and this guy is not letting me do it. And I'm, that's why I'm gonna step out. If a person, if a two police commissioners did something like that, de Blasio would be under siege. Well, I mean, he's under siege called, now, but I'm sorry. They called the city council a bunch of cowards. But that yes. includes de Blasio, includes yeah. him, because he signed that diaphragm law. Yeah, but we're kind of sort of saying the same thing, because all I'm saying is uh, what you're saying, which is um, the chiefs have to take a stance and, and, and do police work. And if they're scolded, whatever, then they resign. Or I was just saying, then they get fired. But, um, but they have to come in unison together, these guys. But then again, he could always pull somebody out from another state. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you can always you can always we, hire someone else, but I think Bill Bratton was from Boston, wasn't he? Yes, um, but you set that precedence by leaving based on it is going to impede on your integrity as a public safety expert. Mm -hmm. That would put De Blasio in a very precarious position for the next person that comes in because it's clear well, that the crime you know, is on its way up. I'll give it to you. Your idea is better. Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't say my idea is better. We just no, have an information exchange. But I think we're both talking about the same thing. We're both talking about um, having the chiefs step up and, and like, do, do your job. I think that the chiefs, I mean, I, you know, I was even like, Bill sent me a clip early and I was amazed that there was a semi pushback coming from one of the chiefs in Comstat. But I just think that it needs to be an organized and concerted effort from all of the members, I should say, well, the executive level of the NYPD to take a stance and say, hey, look, you know what? We care too much for the citizens of New York to allow them to be victimized by failed policies that are emanating from city. But they, they also have to care enough about their cops that they say, no, this cannot go down. This like Inspector Bria, like Inspector Bria in the 4 6 precinct that yeah, resigned. Like he, like him. If there was like yeah. 10 of them, Stand up God. Right. He he will be able to get any job he wants. Yeah, because as a result of taking back. a stand. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, yeah. I just want to address one more thing about buy and bust. Gotcha. Buy and bust is very effective, and I'll tell you why. Because in the big program of uh, broken windows, the people that are being busted for buying a couple of vials of crack on the street, they're the same people if left out there are going to do robberies. They're going to do burglaries. They're going to break into your car. So locking them up for a couple of vials of crack with buy and bust is very effective. In fact, 
in the CompStat program, I think narcotics in the buy and bust program was probably one of the most effective tools that we used to get the criminal element off the street. If you see how many homeless people are out in New York City right now, every night, um, it's, it's unbelievable. And, you know, you're talking about buy and bust, and we have a whole, it's like, um, it's like a fly on a horse's fucking ass right now, what you're talking about. There is, yeah. you know, just the threat of, of, of these people that are hanging out. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, it's intimidating. And the, the, all those people, that's why you see everybody in New York fleeing right now. Everybody's selling their apartments. And guess what? They're not coming back, lots of them. The people that are paying the bills are not coming back because they they've had it with this city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. If you look, <laughs> they're bailing, bro. The quality of life, the quality of life is receding at 100 miles an hour. But just to piggyback on um, what you mentioned, Mark, in terms of the homeless homeless crisis, we for years on end, this has been an extreme battle that we've been fighting in New York City, and it's just it, it, it's perpetually getting worse. It seems like it, New York City is turning into San Francisco. In San Francisco, you have more people that live on the street than live in apartments. And we're getting to that point here in New York. Look, and there hasn't been an answer. I mean, and I think a lot a, of it, again, again, I'll tell you what my answer they is. They don't want to do the, they don't want to, they want to use this money that they get in the budget for something else. Like the Thrive, they, the $900 million they it, from just, Thrive they and wanna, They just want to give it away. Yeah. Because right. they want to downsize the police department. They already got rid of most of the correction department and they don't do anything for the homeless. And this is something that's going on in all these states. They're playing the same game, all of them. When you go to San Francisco, when you go to L.A., or they have these encampments. They're not putting any money into the homeless. They want to save this money for something. I don't know what it is, but they well, want to pull it out of all these programs. There was a program, Thrive NYC, where this was, uh, we lost $900 million has since gone unaccounted for. And this was a program that was commissioned by um, the mayor's wife, Charlene McLean, uh, McCray, whatever, whatever, you know, she was at the forefront of this. $900 million has since gone unaccounted for. And it was designed to assist in the homeless, in the homeless crisis. I think that we've gotten this wrong for too many years on end. And oftentimes we've tried to bifurcate police as a solution to this. Police are not a solution to the homeless crisis. This is something that requires psychologists, um, so people that are, are of a, a sound practitioner's mind in dealing with social conditions. Police are just, unfortunately, we have been that person that's had to backfill the failures of these other organizations. We right. need to get those practitioners at the table to devise a solution, and it hasn't happened. One of the things that I hear, and both of you guys can attest to this, how many times have you run into homeless people on the street and you've offered it? Because we had the cold weather alert, I believe it was like whenever it went below 32 degrees, you had to remove these homeless people that were on the street. Right. So in the midst of one of those cold weather alert emergencies, you speak to the, the homeless people, um, and they don't want to go to the shelters. One of the reasons why they don't want to go to the shelters is because they'll tell you in many instances, they are unsafe environments. Yeah, right. If those shelters are unsafe environments, we need to put a more robust component of security in these shelters to ensure that these things are not happening. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into shelters to lock people up on felony warrants yeah. because I knew that this was, uh, yeah, 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 this was the wealth, so to speak, to get to get these people from i mean it's a sad story but it goes back to they're very violent people in these sh in these shelters it's basically an offshoot of rikers island in a lot of these shelters so it, we need to have a more robust security plan implemented in these shelters and then you'll have more people that are willing to go into these shelters I'll give you bear a in mind the plan is not for long-term, uh, for a person to adopt a homeless shelter as a long-term residence, it should just be a transitionary okay, point into, into quality housing. Yes. Give you a better one. Let's turn Roosevelt Island into a freaking, anybody who's homeless can go there and get a fucking, uh, their own room. Well, they, I mean, right now it's Randall's Why Island. Why yeah, not? Randall's Island is- Well, is whatever, but I'm just saying, okay. it's like, you know, you're talking about uh, adding more security and, you know, even if it's a fucking tent city, create a fucking whatever they want. 
but just give him a place to fucking to just be. Well, I mean, because you, when you think about the shelter system and you think about remember the Will Smith movie, that's exactly what it's like when right. he's got to stand in the line all day to get his bed for the night. And I remember uh, dealing with, um, you know, having to deal with that being in warrants. And, you know, it's funny that you mentioned why I was laughing was because when I you know, when you're doing lineups, you got to get fillers. So then, so then the I'm time. going to Ward's all Island, right? I'm going to Ward's Island, and you know the guy's got a beard. You have your guy, he's like, yo, you have your guy that got the fillers for the guy's you. Guys like, yo, 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 take me. And I'm like, the, uh, the guy's clean shaven, man. You got to get rid of your beard. And he goes, I'll get rid of it, and he takes out a, a bic, right out of his, <laughs> out of his pants, a regular bic, no shaving cream, no nothing, starts oh, shaving man. right there in front of me. What were we giving fillers? Twenty bucks back then. Ten bucks. Ten bucks. What? I was always okay. like, why don't we give them more? You would I keep. Thought, I, I thought it was twenty bucks, but there no, was, was always 10. one sponsor. We always had a sponsor, and it was that person that we connected with and said, "Hey, look, this is what no, I'm looking we had, for." We had a guy and like that, that too. Would, and they, that that person would bring in all of the fillers. Yeah, no, no, we, there was a guy like that in in the, um, and, but he did the Bronx. So to get a hold of him to bring down Manhattan thing was a big pain in the ass. So I used to go a lot of times and go get it myself, but I remember I had to fucking yeah. dry shaving. When I had the two, three rip, they would give you like $300 for the month. We would go through it like in the first week. And then <laughs> in the lineup, you actually had to use your own money. It was ridiculous. Yeah, you know? I never, I never use my own money to well, do the lineup. IOU, yeah. get paid back. Yeah, yeah, but okay. The detective was making overtime. He was coming up with the money for his lineup. Mm. No, no, if it, listen, I, 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 I bought a lot of dentists, man. If it kept this guy cool, man, whatever you want. Yeah. Bro, you know, because if you- You know, that, about, that's another thing. You, Mark, you bring up, Mark, Bill, you bring up very valid points. How many times have we come out of pocket for the sake of public safety yeah. to get the right person in to do something, whether we're sitting down doing an interview with someone and we want to relax them, we buy them food and shit like that. That's People right. don't realize that we come out of pocket quite a bit. And I remember and, as and a Darren, detective. Then the idiot from inspections would be, how come you guys spent $10 on this guy's meal? Well, because he's a homicide perp and he's confessing. You think we want to give him a fucking cheese sandwich? You think he'll confess? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, one time Thank I went you. to, um, it was in Queens, it was a uh, counterfeit. You think of George Floyd, right? Uh, fucking, it was a counterfeit. So I go to this Chinese, uh, it was a takeout, Chinese takeout. This kid that they were holding there, he was like 14 years old. He gave him um, a, a fake $5 bill. It was a Xerox of a $5 <laughs> bill, black and white, not even two sides, just one side. And they were calling the zero up. for effort. So they, <laughs> so I'm looking at this 14 year old kid. I, I, I took him over. I says, why'd you do this? He goes, cause I'm hungry. I said, all right. So I gave him the $5. We took the food and I said, you want anything else? No, no, I'm good. I said, all right, get out of here. Don't worry about it. Bye-bye. Yeah. It. There's a lot of that that you do as a cop that people Every day. just don't say. You just don't say. Um, and I, I have a statement that people closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Cops are closest to the problems that hurt, that occur in the street. I, told, I hope that kid too. I hope We're that gonna, kid. you I did. Hope. You did. No, I you didn't did. know because I helped them more. I said, "Listen to me. Come over oh, here." Okay, I said. I said for, for Christmas, you need to ask your mother for a color printer, and you got to do both sides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, you got me. Bur Boned up his message, right? And you, you know, know, a lot of you know, Dan, a lot of Dan, this Dan, is Dan Bibb is listening to a great Manhattan DA. And today he visited the 4-0 precinct and he was astounded that it wasn't as nice as he thought it was going to be. <laughs> mm. Because when we look at the disease that's plaguing our environments here in a, uh, an urban uh, metropolis like New York, it's crime. So we know what the disease is. Now, what is the cure? The cure is effective and quintessential law enforcement. You have to bring great, uh, great law enforcement into the picture. It's not just like, and I, I, I tell you, I go back to the early 90s. It was hats and bats all day. There were, there were great results quick, but they weren't long-term solutions. Right. When you looked at approaching things from a hats and bats perspective, you got immediate results, but it wasn't long-standing. So when we look to what are the, the long-term solutions that we can buy into in policing, we just, we're, we're not allowing strong and able minds to come to the table 
and present this to our elected officials with them accepting it and saying, okay, you know, this is worth deploying. Um, one thing that I see, and you guys can, can relate to this, the use of technological innovations is stronger now than ever before. When we were cops, everyone wasn't walking around with these. I mean, people were walking around with these towards the end, but the average person in a place like New York is getting photographed or videotaped 100 to 200 times a day. So what the police department has since done, more so particular in the real-time crime center, they've set up um, a universe where they can log into a, a, a commercial establishment um, or, or any of these cameras throughout the city, provided there is a consent degree, a consent decree between the police and the uh, the owners of these camera systems, and that's how they're capturing a lot of these people. And I think that there's been I great success you. there, but that it stopped at a certain point because technology is is still moving forward, and we are still at that point where it's okay. We're getting the camera technology. We're using the late the latent print um, cars. I'm sorry, guys. I agree with you. But what we're lacking is we don't use any technology when it comes to apprehension. And right now, well, no, 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 that's not true. Forward. That's not we're true. Not, there's so many non-lethal weapons out there that we could be using uh, that have been out there for a while and that we, we, okay, we, the never, we never buy them. We okay, never take you. them in. Okay. We never well, take I, I got in. you. In terms of making an arrest on the street, when you say yes, that, I, I, I was so thinking many in terms of finding these out guys. out there that we, the department should be you using know, so you're they, absolutely they, right, Mark. I, I, I totally give you that. What happened was they kept taking away our on our tool belt. We look like Batman out there. You know, you used to have a a, a a a fucking flapjack that you hit somebody in the head with. There was a billy club. There was your nightstick. You had mace. All these different things. And then one by one, they took them away from you. So if you can't fight, the only thing you got is your gun. Hey, Mark, Bill, I want to pose this question to the two of you guys, and I want what your, your take on it. In the wake of this recent diaphragm legislation, do you believe, because this is my uh, inner belief, that you're going to see far more taser usage oh, now yeah. than ever before? Did you see that because cop? the cops just don't want to put their did hands you see that? on people. Did you see the video of that cop? I've he seen did. numerous, numerous videos. It was brilliant because you know what? He did. He went to chase him, and rather than wait to, get, to put his hands on him, he just took the taser out and fucking hit him right in the chest. The, the guy fell down. Right. So there wasn't a physical confrontation. Right. And to me, that's what the weapon is for. It's that's the only them to the end of time and then finally the use the fucking taste. That's, that's you all you have to use because you put your hands on the guys. I'm sorry, Bill. Go ahead. I'm just saying you may get pushback for that. I mean, in the 90s, Anna Moan said, I want everyone using mace much more often. In fact, you didn't even have to use, what was that form we used to fill out? A firearms discharge assault report. Okay. Yeah. Have to fill that out if you use mace. You Pepper can't... space sucks. Yeah. It, it does lot. because it gets it's too messy, especially if you're in an apartment or a hallway or a staircase. It works if you on use me, pepper bro. spray, yeah, yeah, then you you get the fucking back push. Yeah, but and, no, and just... it does look. It, it, it is funny in those videos. You see those yeah. videos. When... Yeah, but <laughs> but, ah! and then, and then, so, right but do you do you guys agree that you're gonna probably see far more taste of usage Absolutely. now than ever well, I before? Think so. and as I, a result I think of that? you know what? I think it's a smarter way to go. Yeah. I, I don't think, you know, if you it, feel like there's gonna be a physical confrontation, and I think that's what I was mentioning about there has to be stun guns. There has to be a a a, 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 a well a stun gun, gun, the taser, the taser is bifurcated. I'm talking about a gun where you can shoot a stunt like a taser, but there's you don't have to worry about the hooks. There's a light there and you just like the way you stun them, like zzz, you could do like that. Star Trek, but from far away. No, but it's, yeah, like it's out Star there. Trek. It's them, out there. Put your phasers and stun no, them. You can, you can, you can Why not? Teleport the guy right to the precinct. I'm talking about. <laughs> no, no, because what I'm saying is, is that the whole thing is just to avoid a, a confrontation where they get hurt. A physical confrontation, hurt. right? You know what I'm saying? Right. Are you going to comply? Yes or no? Right. If not, stun. Boom. That's it. He's on them. No. Yeah, but I, I just, what I was getting at with the taser usage, it's just really going to go through the roof. And this is what's going to happen next. All of these viral videos are going to come out with, every, with people getting tased, and then that's going to be the next um, resource that's going to be removed from officers. Well, right, there are right. just too many people that are being tased, and so we're going to take that away from you. And now and, what's next? Well, well, there's a stun gun that's coming out. And I don't know this for a fact, but somebody should be making it. Or if it already well, 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 it, where, I mean, where it doesn't damage you, 
You know what I'm saying? Where, like, for example, if you have a pacemaker and you get hit with a taser, you get fucked up. Yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. the thing that's gonna happen. That's the thing. Somebody's gonna be. There have been. There have been. People there that has died been, but there's right. gonna be a new one. And that's yeah. when the fucking taser thing is gonna like go through the problem that you just mentioned. But in the, in the meantime, there has to be a stun gun where you could immobilize somebody through their nervous system where they can't fucking move or control their body without damaging them. And that's yeah. what you need to get your hands on. I don't think it's been invented yet. <laughs> you know, it's out yeah, there. Bro. Are you kidding me? No. But it, it it goes back to we need greater logistics for officers to assist them in lieu of putting your hands on people because the days of putting your hands on people are behind you. And I'm not saying it was, you know, I, I'm all for, I hated putting my hands on people, to be honest with you. But there were certain situations that, you know, you had no other choice. You know, a guy's fighting with you, for example. It's yeah. not a hold up. I don't touch anybody, so we can't do that today. You have to do what's necessary to take that person in custody, whether they're using force against you or a third person. And I just think that we, we really need to search for a, another weapon of choice, like Mark mentioned. That like I'm not familiar with the um with this non-lethal weapon that you suggested, but oh, I the just polo think that is now I think now it, there's going to be a steeple chase to find that next non-lethal weapon. Thin, man, these that's guys. They go to meetings all the time. They go to these, um, and they get propositioned all the time. Uh, we used to, when I was in the training unit, we always got bombarded by different type of training stuff. So if you're in the uh, equipment section or if you're in um, at the range, you're always getting bombarded. Those chiefs are getting bombarded with ideas, and they never ever take advantage. It costs money. You got to, you know, it's a big pain in the ass. So. Until it's absolutely necessary, they don't do it. And right now, it's absolutely necessary. You have to come up with something, uh, more non-lethal weapons. The bolo wrap is another one. You know what I'm saying? That thing, it's not going to choke you. I don't understand. It's impossible for that thing to choke you. It goes around your legs. It goes around your torso. That's it. Man. I don't understand. But you can't use a bolo wrap on every single arrest. I'm not every single arrest, but when you can. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? I just you got a guy who's running away from you. You fucking shoot him with the bolo wrap. Hmm. Now he's not running away from you. Well, just, no, just the diaphragm law has to be reversed. It, we just cannot go forward with that being the law. And if it's not reversed, the city's going to turn into the Wild West. It really will. You know? I wholeheartedly agree with you there, though. There's going to be a case, there always is, where it's going to be... Um, questionable at best it's not a bad situation and somebody wanted to make a big deal out of it and it's going to go to the supreme court and then they'll figure it out it's going to go all the way yeah, but one of the yeah, things but... we spoke about last last time you were on and we you you said something i i don't know actually i don't think that's your position on but you spoke about how some neighborhoods uh can be perceived as being over policed and my okay. my, my retort to that was that because the 3 2 precinct in Harlem has different problems than the 19th precinct on the Upper East Side. Or the 7 3 in Brooklyn. Okay. Get, right, the 7 3, the 7 5. Uh -huh. They get shootings, they get murders. The 19th precinct is mostly property crimes. So you police okay. communities like that differently. And I don't agree with the term over policing. I would say policing it differently because they have different problems. Well, when you okay. talk about. And it's I can I can answer that and I can give you a a, a better articulation as to where I, where I am. When I refer when I use the term over policing, um, and I think both of you guys can relate to this. These are places that we we gave out overtime for stop, question, and frisk, shooting overtime. It was proactive overtime that we injected into certain communities, and so as a result of that. What would happen? I would have, let's say, hypothetically, when I was a sergeant, I'd have maybe eight cops out with me. And I would tell them before they got out of the van, this is what I'm looking for for the tour. And just based on that, what the guys did was they went out within the first two hours of the tour and they gave me what I was looking for. Right. OK, you want eight summonses or whatever. And that's an example of over policing. Right. Because after I got that in that two hours, you know what we did? We drove around, we, we were looking for food, 
Um, we looked, we, we, we went into business districts looking at other things, but right. our job was complete after we did those first two hours. So that's what, when I speak to the over-policing aspect, that's right. where, that's what I was spotlighting. And then it's not just my one in eight. As a lieutenant, as a platoon commander, I, I can go out with, there was times that I've gone, I've had, I've worked in commands, whereas when I was up in the Heights, for example, I had people that came in from different commands to assist where we had like a specific initiative, such as <laughs> let's say it was like a club night or something to that effect. Worked in the task force, yeah. You know, so as a result of that, what we did was we came in there specifically looking for certain things. When we didn't find those things, that's when we found other things. Right. And when those other things came up, I came in with a number. And the reason why I came in with a number is because I want to get this overtime again. Because if I put you out on this overtime and you don't bring me anything, you'll never see your name right. on the sheet ever again. That's All right. So, well, and so I understand what you're saying, Bill. The policing in, in a community, let's say like the 7 3 precinct, is going to be very different than the, the policing in the 17th precinct. Right. I got that. But we also have to understand we're guilty of doing much more or, or, or functioning in a far more aggressive manner in a high crime precinct because we know that this is a place that, yes, they're experiencing a lot of crime, but secondly, people will be okay with it if I do it here as opposed to if I went into the 17th and did, say, did the same thing in the 7-3 that I did in the, in the 17th. But well, you know, to your credit, to your credit, you have to I, you you have to police differently geographically, and I got that part too. So where is the happy medium in this, Mark? I know I'm you want to say you. something. I apologize. I'm cutting no, you. No, no. I'm just, first of all, just at the tail end, you mentioned uh, it does happen in, in in the other precincts. Look at how they destroyed the whole club area on 11th Avenue between 26th and 27th Street. That was a thriving thing. Right. Um, uh, Bloomberg went in there with his uh, task force of uh, building and fire and police and all this other nonsense, and he shut down that whole march operation. Okay, but that's that my point. Is this, this, yeah. When you think about um, Amadou Diallo, what what was that? That was over. I was I was working that night as a sergeant. That was over because what happened was you put street crime over there. And of course, they're going to hit hard. And in the beginning, I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. And I'm going to tell you, I was working that night when that happened. If you look at Amadou Diallo and you look at the description that we, we were, I was, we were all looking for this rapist. There was a serial rapist that was plaguing the upper um, Manhattan North and the Bronx. He had raped upwards of 30 different women. There were gross similarities in the two, but the, the execution in how street crime into that particular interaction. Did you, any of you guys know um, Steve Silks? No. He committed suicide? Uh, he committed suicide. Bill, you knew Steve? Yeah, yeah, okay. He was a duty inspector that night. I was a sergeant when it happened. And it was one of those things where street crime were the stars, whether you like it or not, like whether the anti-crime cops in the precinct, these are the stars. They look to converge on these dangerous situations as opposed to running away from it and taking an early 63 right. or a meal break. As I think that there were some tactical errors there. And one of the things that I point to was they were working in a plainclothes unit without a sergeant. That was like, at that time, in the early 90s, that was completely against the rules. All plainclothes units had a sergeant working with them and they didn't have a sergeant. And I think that that was one of the, that was one of the ways that perpetuated a potentially dangerous situation that right. came to fruition with Diallo losing his life. I think it could have been handled differently, well, but I, okay, I'm sorry. My point, my point was this. My point was that at that particular time, you were in a command for three months. The four, three. You were three months, four months, having to take a certain amount of guns off the street. And obviously, when you hit it at first, there's going to be a lot of people. Uh, you're going to get a lot of guns. And then at some point, we got to move the people. And right. these people, you know, because uh, otherwise it's going to dry out. Everybody knows you're there. And these cops are under pressure because they ha still have to come up with the number. Absolutely. You know, and Absolutely. now it's a certain time of night. And it's like, what are you doing out? But I didn't know. That's the first time I ever heard about the uh, the rapist there. So yes, that's what they were out there. But we I, did, I didn't know. I never knew. Rapist. Uh, but... and, it, and, and it was a gross similarity between Amadou Diallo and the rapist.
But that, that being said, my point, I still stick to my point is just that, you know, unfortunately, we were a lot of times we were slow to like, okay, this neighborhood's dried out. Somebody should be like, this neighborhood's dried out. We should go somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? Because at that point right now, if you're worried about getting four guns a month and there's nothing out here anymore, what the no. fuck are we supposed to do? Now you got to, now you got to stop people that, you know, just stop this. That's hey, Mark. That's where the over-policing comes into play. That's, that was my point. Or that was my yeah. original point. I, I brought up Amadou Diallo. I didn't know about the, uh, the, the yeah. other thing, but well, so Darren, the other thing was is that back then they had also diluted street crime. They thought they had diluted the talent because street crime was meant to be only a hundred to one hundred fifty, maximum two hundred guys. Yeah, you put you're right. Four hundred guys in the unit, so yeah. you couldn't have the level of talent putting four hundred guys in that unit, uh, and then thinking you were going to get the same. Great result. point, Bill. Great so, point, Bill. When they initially, they were only turning out of Randall's Island and you had a select group. They were like the Navy SEALs of the NYPD, right. if you right. want to refer to them as that. But once you universalized and, and, and expanded the concept and made it citywide, that's when the dilution came into play. And I got to agree with that. Um, but I think uh, what the department saw was quantitatively, they were doing amazing work at this small, at, at the small unit. And right. they felt as if, look, you know, it's, it's, this unit is so good, let's build on the model of success. And that's why they expanded it. Well, I it was the wrong safer. thing. I think Safer said, if we can get 5,000 guns with 150 guys, so if we have 300 guys or 400, we should be able to, you know, double or triple. Exactly. Right, but right, right. Captain Savage or Deputy Inspector Savage, who had been in street crime most of his career, told the CO back then, that's not how this unit works. And I, I don't want to paraphrase him, but this is what I heard. No, no, I got you. No, no, I understand. That, you know. Hey, don't get me wrong. Also, too. When we have a lot of talented guys and we keep the number down and we jump from, you know, we stay in the precinct two or three weeks and we leave. That was the, the whole I'm a, I'm a firm believer in, unfortunately, this collateral damage. And if you want to do the numbers and you want to say that we were, I don't know, over 2,000 homicides a year. And then we went to uh, a little over 300 a year. That's 1,700 lives saved a year for how many years? It was probably like 15 years. So, you know, that, that's got to account for something. You, you know what's... Yeah, but you know what's so weird about that, Mark? When we were made, when we had two thousand homicides, we probably had more collars then than than at the time when we had the lowest number of crimes. Like everyone was going out and making collars then. You know, they that's when the cops. I find it's weird. I found that the cops were very proactive. Like back in the early nineties, like during the crack wars, yeah. I would go out with a team of guys and we would actively go out in pursuit of filling up that prisoner van with bodies. And we did it. And they weren't drug collars either. You couldn't bring in a marijuana a multitude. collar. Oh, pot collar. Oh, forget about it. That was non-existent. You that was go outside that was and get a robbery collar. Just go outside. No, no. get a robbery collar, just go outside. Yeah. So, but the reason why I bring that up is I, there, was a, there was a seismic shift in society as well in connection with people's outlook on the the the, the the social norms, so to speak. Whereas like when we look at, when you look at the true theory of broken windows, it wasn't just policing. It was, if there's the term broken windows comes into play because if there's an abandoned building, we wanna, we wanna fix it. If there's graffiti in the, if there's the graffiti on the, um, on the streets, we wanna remove it because people have the belief of if they're in a place that's maintained, they wanna be a participant in maintaining it. But if nobody gives a shit, and there's garbage all over the place, then why should I give a shit? I'm just gonna do the same as everyone else. So it went, it, it ran parallel with the followers mentality and it, it worked and it was consistent. That's interesting that you bring that up because you can't get rid of any of this graffiti right now. Yeah, like what just... happens when we get back to business and the criminal, the courts houses are open? Like how long are you gonna stay with it looking like that downtown? I got news for you. The courts are up and running. That's a falsehood that's being projected by de Blasio well, but you know, and the like chief the fact, administrative the judge. I'm just saying Even, the way it was. Um, right now, my understanding they're doing is... All these, uh, uh, you know, um, these... Um, yeah, what do they call it? Arraignments. They're doing them online right now. Yes, they are. 
And uh, right now they're in the process of sanitizing that area that's been plagued with graffiti in the wake of the Occupy City Hall movement that's recently been sanitized? removed. Well, like they have people down there that they're cleaning the graffiti off of the off the walls <laughs> and <laughs> the streets. <laughs> yeah, so as a result of that, um, they are looking to make that change, but the mayor should be embarrassed that he was the um, the elected official that or the incumbent that was in play when all of this happened. This is I don't his think fault. He's embarrassed at all? I think he's proud of it. I think this no, is no, no. Funny. He he has to because what happened is it universalized. CNN, Fox News, MSNBC all gave it surgical coverage to show that this is what's happening here as a result of the failed policies. And but but just going back to the other thing in terms of the graffiti being removed, and you asked me if the, when the courts get uh, get get up and running, the courts are up and running. A lot of the arraignments are happening remotely, but people are still having their cases processed in court. Um, there's an argument that this 800 plus people that have open gun cases that are on the street, um, because what they did was they extended the 18080 day. 18080 day is basically look if you don't bring the court the this this case in front of a grand jury by a certain number of days, then that person can't can no longer be detained. We have a lot of that happening right now, but I, I just can't understand how those gun cases are holding in the positions that they're in. I don't quite understand how they how they're holding the grand jury proceedings because no one is getting jury duty let, um, letters and like how would they go online to do jury duty? That's something I don't know. Uh, maybe but, they're doing the one. Maybe they're they're dr they're dragging their feet with that one eighty eighty so that this way they can just dismiss the cases because they didn't bring it in court in time. Man, I don't know. If they but took I the run off the street. Uh, their idea probably is: what do we need the body for? The guns off the street. That's their idea. Yeah, now, but guns don't kill, guns don't kill people. People do. Go ahead, Bill. I just wanted to bring up one thing. You mentioned uh, broken windows policing. And one of the things, the only way good broken windows policing works is if the DA's office is on board too. And they're not on board anymore. No. They were pro prosecute, you know, they weren't prosecuting the looters during the, the week we had the rioting. Bill, so Bill, that's board. Bill, that's a terminal piece in this. But a lot of this reverts back to bail reform that was enacted by Governor Como a couple of months ago. That in many ways is causing this because it, I can't necessarily blame the DAs if the cases are being brought in front of a judge and the judge is releasing someone without bail. So, I, I mean, the DA will present the case in an, in an open court, but it's ultimately the judge that's releasing people because bail reform is the norm. But Vance is not prosecuting lower level crimes, period. I believe that that's happening to a point, and that's not only happening in the Bronx, that's happening in, um, uh, that's not only happening in Manhattan, it's happening, Gonzalez is doing the same thing out in Brooklyn. A lot of these DAs throughout the city are doing something somewhat consistent. And I do agree that we need to um, pro um, prosecute these cases with a level of, of intestinal fortitude that keeps these people behind bars. It's just not happening. And it's like, like I said, activist, it's like activist DAs. Where yes. do we get DAs that are activists? How Sad, that but you know? Sad but true. Sad but true. Sad but true. And you know who's suffering? The, the public. Eight and a half million citizens that yeah. live in New York City. Exactly. And you know, when you release criminals, it makes us safer. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Just ask the mayor. I, I just can't, you know, that's like, it's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable statement. Empty yeah, but, and emptying state prisons makes us safer. <laughs> this is a guy that's out of touch. You know, if you listen to de Blasio, he'll tell you to go home, smoke pot with your 12 year old son on a couch yeah. and everything will be OK. You know, so. What well, could you you know, say? they all have their own security. And that's the interesting thing. You know, we you don't see any defunding of the mayor's security detail. Well, you know, and they all, yeah, they all that's, a, that's an odd thing. That's an odd thing. Yeah. There's all these people that are preaching to us about defunding the police. Uh, they all have security. Yes. They go yeah. all afford security. Yeah. You know. So. And um, I'm I don't investing. Know how anyone could volunteer for that detail, protect the Blasio or the city council. I wouldn't want to be near those people. 
Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of perks involved. You got to get yeah, yeah, if I you're know a detective, that. you're gonna get first what? grade. <laughs> yeah, you got to yeah, you got to get cra- you you got to get promoted if you're a detective. If you're yeah. a sergeant, you got to get the special assignment. Money I used to so. love meeting the guys that had grade from those units that all they did was suck dick, you know. And then when they tried <laughs> to work with you, and you're like, dude, where did you get first grade from? You shouldn't even have to be a detective, you know. They can't like, invest. They can't investigate their way out of a paper. No, I, I, I worked. Know. I worked in the Warren Squad, and I worked with three of the craziest people that I ever met. Um, ever met in my life, let alone the job. And they, they were all in the Warren Squad. These three guys. They used to hang out. They were a team. They were like all in one team, and they were all these big bodybuilder guys, right? And uh, they used to intimidate their boss and stuff. What and, borough was this? I don't want to say. I don't, I don't. Oh, okay. So anyway, so what happened was they got a call from one of their old sergeants that um, he he was in charge of the Bloomberg detail and uh, they needed bodies. So why don't you come here? You know, this way you don't have to catch cases for a couple of months. He's never going to win, you know, uh, but at least you don't have to, you know, you take like a three month break from catching cases. Then you go back to wherever you were. So of course these three crazy the guys these guys go there, and then Bloomberg wins. <laughs> so now they're on the mayor's detail, and each, yeah. each one of them got bounced out at some point for doing some crazy shit. But <laughs> it was just so funny that they lasted like a year or longer. And I'm telling they you, these guys things. were crazy, man. Right, they were just skating. They you were know, just I skating. remember they, we had a major case in the two three it was either a homicide or something, and two detectives from Intel Intel came there whatever the reason was and Resnick made them do a building canvas you had to see their face they were like, oh, we mm. don't do that we're intel go yeah. to the canvas that's an order <laughs> Resnick was a lunatic but I, I gotta it. guys I have to work on something else because like, I'm totally behind on this okay. but I just I'm, I'm so like- glad that you guys had me on and I can't wait to come back on again Time flies. I've been on an hour and 15 minutes. I feel like I've been on with you guys for 20 minutes. It's just time to just only- I'm not even drinking. Uh, I just wanted to say, Darren, I know I know, I know that you're really busy and uh, you know, I really, really appreciate that you come on. Uh, I, I appreciate you guys time. having me. It was a lot of fun, man. But Darren, Always. next time I want you to wear a suit and tie, man. I'm not used I'm to- I'm dressed. I want the team and leave all of this. And leave I want all the team room, man. <laughs> he looks good. I like the Sounds team good. Room. All right. That'll be on the next one, next version. All, All right. right, guys, be Please. safe. I right. hope to hope to appear again soon. All right, thanks, thanks again. All the best. All right, bye now.